Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And I know everyone watching is taking time out of their day to hang out with us. So I really appreciate it uh, because these small talks are such a unique way to give you a more in-depth look into the work and practice of the amazing artists we work with. So these three artists we're talking to today, Jennifer Georgescu, Yevgenia Mikhailik, sorry about that, and Gail Schneider were all part of our recent art auction. And Although we weren't able to have the auction exhibition open to the public for very long, um, you can still look through the images of the gallery and the artwork on the art auction page of our website. So in case you're not familiar with the art auction, uh, before the museum closed to the public in March, all of the 128 silent auction artworks by 78 artists were on view as an exhibition. It was then reimagined as a series of virtual events throughout June. And since we had so many excellent artists involved, we were only too happy to have the opportunity to dive into their practices and give our audiences a chance to learn more about the amazing artwork our community does uh, and do lots of programs such as studio visits and prep panels such as this, so much more. Uh, but we are here to discuss the artwork. So let me tell you a little bit about Jennifer, Yevgenia, and Gail. Adam, could you bring up that uh, slide that shows their artwork from OMA's auction? All right, perfect. All right, so although their works in the auction are not very similar, I was really drawn to the practices of all three artists, uh, especially the otherworldliness and the fantastical elements of each artist's work. Uh, they have almost a, a surreal feeling if you disambiguate the definition of the word surreal from the, the surrealism movement. They have this disorienting quality of a dream, at least from my perception. I really love how each artist uses their own creative process to explore personal identity and connections to others in the environment in a way that really targets the viewer's emotions so that we as viewers can discover more about ourselves through the experience of art. So you can see uh, Gail's two artworks on the left, the ear and the butterfly with her distinctive brick patterning that she uses to render natural and organic forms in a rigid and inorganic material. Uh, Yevgenia's two works in the top center and top right, which use very delicate mark making and uh, flowing forms to depict these brooding natural forms. And Jennifer's photograph from her mother series that explores how dramatically her sense of self changed when she became a mother, a topic that I can relate very closely to uh, with my 10 month old baby at home. So now uh, let's hear from the artists and dive into how and why they do what they do. Uh, Gail, Yevgenia, and Jennifer, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Uh, Gail, let's start with you. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. Uh, well, I was uh, born in the Hudson Valley of uh, New York State, about 90 miles north of New York City, which is a, a very beautiful area and has four very rich seasons. And I think the beauty of that area with mountains and rivers had a huge effect on my feelings about beauty and nature. And so in the piece that's on the screen, um, I started working with um, uh, wood and clay pieces, found pieces of wood and clay. And um, originally um, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin and then I went to Berkeley and I studied with uh, Peter Volkus, who was a very famous ceramic artist in Berkeley, but I didn't study ceramics. I studied sculpture. Um, I should have studied ceramics, but I didn't know I'd end up doing clay work at the time. But you, I was very influenced by all the ceramic artists that were there. And California has such a strong tradition of ceramics. So it was something I've always been interested in. And then in about 1989, I started working in clay. So these pieces were found wood pieces and clay. And the pieces that are brick, um, the way that came about was like this piece. Um, I also did a whole series of insects. But at one point when I was having trouble finding, uh, not, I couldn't find quite the right piece of wood to, to work with. I just, I was uh, reading and I came upon the, in, ancient, in the ancient city of uh, Babylon in Mesopotamia, there were these wonderful walls and they were all brick. 
and they were guard the walls that guarded protected the city and they were lined with fantastical animals and lions that were made out of brick that were in relief from the walls but they were just brick but they seemed to like emerge from the walls and so that um when i was reading that i decided i i thought it was so interesting that this hard material could still be so sensuous and and had this realistic feeling of this magical beast so i started working in brick and this piece on the screen was a piece i did at oceanside uh, for the allied craftsman exhibit called artifacts and the the starfish or um the reason this, i did the starfish was they were disappearing from PB, from the Crystal Pier. And um, I, my husband and I have always gone to the PB and walked on this, the beach. And so I was kind of really angry that the starfish were disappearing. So at the time, I, before I did this piece for Oceanside, I did this whole series of starfish because I decided I would do something that would make them very permanent. And so I did them in brick and that was the beginning. And then this piece was in the, the artifact show, which also has um, cursive letters, which I also thought that was an artifact since people don't seem to print anymore or use cursive. And um, let's see, what's the next? Oh, these are the, um, and then um, I, I did this butterflies. I've always been interested in insects and I've done a whole insect series, but also, I felt that this had a lot to do with the problems at the border. So I used all the uh, signs the keep out, the no trespassing signs, to create these butterflies, which also migrate across the border from the United States. Um, and so that's how this series came about. And then this series was um, is at the airport. And it it's still currently at the airport. Yes, and it oh, will be there until spring because of COVID-19. It didn't oh, come down. <laughs> Usually the installations are one year, but uh, this is a two-year installation. And uh, what terminals? Uh, terminal uh, one, it's two. Terminal 2, the I new know. terminal, and it's Gate 24, Alaska Airlines. Right. So um, the airport has a wonderful program for artists, and I encourage anyone, everyone, to apply for it. Um, so this was a series of sea urchins and starfish and then below in the showcase there are other ocean things um, you can't really see it in the picture I don't think but um, so I just sort of and then this is the newest series I started I did during COVID-19 called City um, I would normally be traveling at this time of year and so when COVID-19 came and we couldn't travel, I uh, was thinking a lot about cities. And so I started doing what I considered a city. And there are 15 of these and they range from two feet high. Uh, I think the tallest one is about 24 inches high. And uh, it's about 50 inches wide, the whole grouping. And so to me, I, it sort of represents a city. So oh, that's, really that's the latest pieces I've done. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's so different from your other work that I've seen. I uh, I really like to see how your your style and your subject matter is progressing. Now um, I never know what's going to happen. But. Right, <laughs> right. Um, all right, uh, let's uh, move on to Jennifer. Could you tell us a little bit about your practice and your work? Um, yes. Yeah, so I was formerly trained as a painter and also as a photographer, um, and I think from an very early stage, I always knew that I was meant to combine the two mediums together. Uh, and so I was always searching for ways to do that by like double exposing or painting on my negatives, uh, cutting negatives by hand and um, splicing them together. And when I was introduced to digital technology, it kind of became like home to me and I was for the first time able to really be able to paint with photographs and for me photography had you know it has this historical power of truth and and even though we know it's not true any longer it still has you know some remnants of that that paintings can never have 
And so I think that the surrealistic style, um, as you know, using the wording that you used, um, derives from um, the marrying of those two mediums, kind of pushing the boundary of what is real and um, what is our perception. And these are kind of like my family photographs. I think these are, are more true than anything in, in my photo albums. Um, so I, I started this body of work called Mother Series five years ago, um, right after I had my first son. And in the, the early moments, I was kind of shocked to find that I had lost my sense of self. And I was prepared for all of the normal things that people talk about, things like, you know, you'll be up all night and there'll be constant feedings, but I was not prepared for not feeling like myself. I didn't have time to think and I wasn't able to dream. And I kind of felt like this shadow from the past kind of person. And I wanted to make work that accurately depicted what motherhood really feels like, that it's something so wonderful and something so horrible that can take place at the same time. Um, and I think um, using words like that when it comes to your children um, is kind of unacceptable. Uh, even, even now, um, you kind of seem like you seem ungrateful or unworthy in some way. Um, and, and for me, you know, when you describe any other kind of relationship, obviously there's um, ups and downs and there's ebbs and, and flows and um, that's completely normal and acceptable. And so I wanted to, to say these things in a, you know, about a mother and child relationship that we don't normally see and we don't normally hear about. Um, but I think as time went on, I began to realize that I felt that my son was kind of a part of myself, like an actual appendage, and that it was hard for me to view him as a separate person. And I thought, well, isn't, I mean, that's the most powerful thing I think you can experience. And I don't think that exists in any other capacity. I don't think um, you can really um, transcend the barrier between self and other in any other relationship. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I often look to my own life's experiences and uh, moments in my life that I see that are poignant and I know that um, other people can relate to. And I just try to tell the truth in my work um, uh, conceptually. Um, I'm not interested in taking a photograph of something that's there. I'm interested in conveying the, um, the feeling of what's there. And do you have more than one child now? Uh, yes, and so now I have two sons and um, the work has kind of progressed along by itself without me intending to change its aesthetic. Now that we're three, uh, you know, it had to become a lot busier. You know, there's a lot more going on. And there's, I'm a control freak about my images. I, I plan them, you know, I, I light them how I want them. They're completely planned out beforehand. But when you work with children, it's very hard to work that way. And so there's kind of always this element of surprise um, that, that works. And um, it's, it's very interesting. And this is the, the longest project that I've been working on, I'm still currently making images, but um, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I suppose you will always be a mother. And as long as they'll sit still at least a little bit, <laughs> they, will, yeah. they will be able to, to be your, your muses. Uh, Yevgenia, please tell us uh, about yourself and your practice. Sure, um, so um, I'm a painter and illustrator. I was trained as an illustrator, um, but that's, there's sort of, you know, obviously a lot of um, parallels and um, I don't do a whole lot of commercial illustration work, but um, I mostly focus on um, uh, painting. So a lot of my work deals with um, this idea that, you know, we were sort of um, really connected to the environment and to natural surroundings, but at the same time, very much disconnected from it. And it's sort of um, progressively, that disconnect progressively grows and, and gets worse. And so um, there are a lot of kind of um, environmental um, themes in all of this work. But uh, so this piece that's on the screen, um, 
was made about a year and some ago for um, an exhibition that really looked at how the, the parallels kind of between the human experience and natural phenomena and uh, between the environment and um, our bodies um, or land and landscape and bodies. And um, I was kind of looking at a way to, to bridge some of those divides and also um, in, not instill, but kind of um, open a conversation about a, a, the sense of empathy towards the natural environment, the same way that we can empathize with one another, which, you know, is kind of a naive way of looking at the problem. If we can't, you know, see humanity within certain groups of people, let alone um, the environment, it is kind of a... Um, naive way of looking at it, but it's also kind of a necessary one. And so I'm um, thinking about um, ways in which we can find these connections with, with the natural world that are the, the natural world that is immediately outside of our, our own bodies. Um, so a lot of the work has um, connections between, um, you know, these um, sort of bodily images and um, images of stone or uh, like rock formations or um, land formations. Um, so there are a lot of different kind of ways to, to connect the, the two different um, aspects of what it is to exist in a natural um, environment and be part of that natural environment. Um, so it's about connection, it's about lack of connection and kind of how to, how to bridge that and, and um, you know, find a way to relate to an environment or um, our state of the environment and hopefully through that relationship start to kind of be a better steward of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're just incredible images and I really feel like although there are not um, a lot of um, the kind of animal forms, human forms in there, the the flowing of the the watercolor and the ink that you use is so natural and organic. I'm, you almost kind of pick out animal forms in there or or flesh-like forms that it's mm -hmm. it seems like a really true melding of um, hard earth surfaces with uh, r rounded more organic. Well, I guess, of course, earth is organic. I'm, I'm not finding the right word to describe what I'm saying, but I love bodies almost. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I noticed uh, between uh, Jennifer and Yevgenia's work is they're both very atmospherically dark. They're very, um, I used the word brooding before. And so I wondered but for the two of you, what draws you to this, this darkness, these uh, very deep colors, deep, rich colors? Uh, let's start with Jennifer. Um, well, for me, I, I see humanity is kind of existing at this intersection of, you know, beauty and chaos and darkness and light. And I think my images are very um, inviting and, and beautiful uh, through their, you know, through the colors and through the richness and through the um, you know, the, the weight of the light, if that makes sense. Um, and so they're at once kind of grotesque and they're beautiful. And that's kind of what I'm talking about in the body of work. It's this, this push and pull of belonging together and our struggle to be apart. Yeah, definitely. And Yevgenia. Yeah, it's, um, I think a lot of it, ha or a lot of the color sensibility kind of comes from um, looking at the colors that are found in the body or in the flesh and so there's that that connection um you know a lot of the landscapes are not necessarily going to be red and purple and, and blue and have these like really dark kind of um rich colors but that is a way to again connect it back to like the visual representation of the body but also um i think it it does have like this really kind of grounding sort of quiet um sense about it like uh the piece that's behind me that was on that um first slide um having that dark background kind of invites a really quiet sort of um 
moment with with the work it's like having the lights on and having the lights off in a room produces a very different feeling of that of that environment of that space um lights off kind of makes you feel like it's a quiet time and so it's it's sort of a way to um have the viewer slow down a little bit maybe and and kind of spend a little bit more time with the work and really sort of feel that sense of quiet and um kind of a meditative um state yeah yeah i definitely see that there is a, a sense of quiet in in both of your works uh, and and stillness and meditation um and uh with the ethereal otherworldly feeling i i wanted to hear more from each artist about how you personally describe your styles and who your influences are um so let's start with gail oh well um i feel like in my life i've you know, lived around artists probably all my life because i lived in i started out when i was younger living in soho in new york and different places but I also have known a lot of writers and scientists, and I think all that has had a huge influence on me and on my work. Um, uh, I don't really know exactly how to explain it, but um, I've always done a lot of reading, which has a huge effect on, on what I do. And um, I've, I think that that's probably the thing that's mo the connections I've made with people, different kinds of people other than just artists, but I mean, different kinds of artists. Um, and my reading has had probably the biggest effect on me. And of course, just nature. I'm, yeah, I'm, of course. You know, Clearly nature is a, is a huge influence in your, in your work. Huge um, influence in my work. And, have you always explored similar forms or um, like what, what kind of uh, imagery did you explore at the beginning of your career? Well, you know, in the beginning, I'm trying to think, actually, um, I did sculpture and then they were sort of minimal when I was at Berkeley because that was in the 70s. That was sort of what I was doing. Um, but I always did. I did things outside that were silk and steel. And then when I uh, moved to New York City, I actually began painting and I painted for a long time. And then when I um, moved back, at left the city, I actually got a, a grant and so it gave me time and I started doing ceramics. And I felt I needed something that was a little more hands-on for me and um, I like solving problems. So using kind of mixed media and ceramics um, worked with the kind of, the, the way that I like to work. You know, I don't always know what I'm doing. I don't always have the skills I need, but I'm perfectly willing to learn them. So I, I didn't, I've never taken a ceramics class, but you know, I, I read about what I need to know or I ask people. And, and to me, I think, uh, I don't know if I'm a ceramicist because I usually really do mixed media, but um, that's how it's sort of evolved. No, I think we could call you a ceramicist in that you work with uh, ceramics as a material. Well, I work with wood and steel. And, <laughs> That's you know, true. This is true. Things. This is true. Yeah, but I, I think that that spirit of constantly learning and then having a vision of something you want to accomplish. Yeah, I love like the idea of you know, having to learn something new if I want to make something, I have to figure out how to do it. Exactly. It feels so good to accomplish that. Um, so Jennifer, tell 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 us more. You did say that like you can see the the connections to surrealism in your work. Um, and so who are your your influences, um, and is that really how you would describe your style in one word, or is there a more expansive um, oh. description? Well, I kind of I, I consider myself a conceptual photographer, and I kind of liked what what Gail just said about you know you have this you know you have this idea in your head and you go to any means possible to be able to make that happen in reality and that's exactly how I work too it's just I have um, images that pop in my head and I have to rework them and rework them in my head until it's just right and then making that into a reality is that's the rewarding part for me is the the ability to be able to do that and so um I sometimes I build giant props. Sometimes it's um, you know dollhouse scale, or you know it's 
um, it's not as important how I make it. It's the, the end concept and does it portray the right feeling? And I feel in photography, there's kind of this divide between this straight photography or manipulated. And um, I think manipulated art, digitally manipulated art is a little bit looked down upon. Um, uh, I, I think people think, oh, you, you Photoshopped it. You know, it's like you click a button and, you know, it, the magic happens or something. And um, for me, it's, you know, it's really painting. So I spend weeks like digitally painting these images together, um, which creates that aesthetic. Um, I mentioned earlier that I was early on always manipulating the, the nature of the medium. Um, by splicing together negatives or um, double exposing. And so I, in the beginning, was looking at influences like Sandy Skoglund and her use of sculpture to uh, kind of take over a space and create this otherworldly, you know, surrealistic, I'd say, feeling and quality. And um, Gregory Crudson, who, who molds his light, you know, his light is, is what makes the image. Um, and then I think um, Cindy Sherman and Shauna and Robert Park Harrison are big um, uh, influences on my work for kind of acting, being the actor or the every person in the work. And I, I really like that way of working. It comes, you know, even, even more of a personal like, procedure, I guess you could say that um, I am able to control every aspect of the work that way. Yeah, yes. Um, I can see definitely uh, how uh, a number of those artists are come through in your work. Um, and so you said you can spend weeks digitally manipulating um, until you get to the right image, but how long does it take, say, from concept to completion uh, to, to finish one work? I'd say the, the concept, um, like working it out in my mind, takes about two weeks that I know the image is there and it's coming and I have to, to think of think and think that until I get it right, that's the one I wanna make. Um, and shooting it is very fast. Like the, the photography part is probably takes me, you know, I mean, I guess I have, I have to set everything up beforehand and then bring my kids in to shoot because I have only a couple minutes to work with them. So right. um, the, the, the lighting part takes a long time and then the shooting part is a very small portion and then kind of combining all of those elements together um, and I like, I like this way of working because I can build the space from the inside out. So when you take a photograph, it's kind of already a square or it's a rectangle, but I don't start that way. I start with pieces. So I piece these things together and space is very important. It's this tension of coming together and pulling apart. And so they become as long or as tall as they need to be. And, um, that's that's a major a part of it. I can um, just being able to make the space the most important part. Yes, excellent. Yeah, that definitely. I, that's really interesting to know that, of course, you take a photo and it's this shape, but when you're manipulating an image, it has to become the shape of what the goal is in mind uh, and how those elements end up stacking together. Mm -hmm. um, Yagenia, please uh, tell, tell me a little more about how you would describe your, your style. Um, I'd say almost your, yours to me is the most hard one to define as surreal, but it still has that really uh, otherworldly quality. So uh, yeah, how would you define your style and your influences? Yeah, it's, I think, I mean, it is kind of difficult to put a term to it or like a single descriptor, but um, definitely borrows from surrealism or some elements of it. Um, but it also takes from botanical illustration and mapping and like that visual language of mapping um, from traditional Korean landscape painting. Um, I mean, there are a lot of different kind of influences that show up in different proportions at different times, depending on you know what I'm working on or thinking through at the at any given moment. Um, I do look a lot at um, like old botanical illustration and, and kind of like the early days of um, microscope microscopes and, and like the discoveries that came out of that, like Ernst Haeckel's work and um, all of the just otherworldly even though they are of this world, uh, images of everything from plants to bacteria and everything that, um, you know, he was documenting um, 
while he worked and um, those things kind of find their way into both the really large pieces but also kind of the smaller more intimate um, drawings and they're kind of there's this like macro micro um, thing that happens that I think is really um, interesting and um, Julie Meritu is a big influence I mean her work is just mind-blowing and the way that she utilizes movement in her work or just the, that that um, depiction of movement in her work is really um, really influential and I um, look for ways to kind of capture that same sense of of motion and um but at the same time just like stillness so it's it's always like a kind of a push and pull and i think she you know accomplishes that in a really really successful way um i mean there are a lot of things that go into um or a lot of influences that go into this work georgia o'keefe has become really important as a way to and um you know she borrowed from surrealism quite a bit as well, even though she wasn't, you know, part of any movement really. Um, I think the way that she approached landscape painting is really um, in a way similar to how I approach it as well, where they're not traditional landscapes. Like I don't work from um, like on location almost ever. Um, she did and she would bring um, works that she would start on location and kind of finish them in the studio. but. Um, for me, it's more about kind of bringing in the memory of being on at a, at a specific place um, and the memory of the feeling of or sensation of being in that environment um, into the studio. So it's um, that's kind of a big starting point for a lot of these works. And um, yeah, I think it, you're not wrong to say that there, there is surrealism in this work for sure. I mean, there it's not, I wouldn't describe it as surreal, but some elements from from that um, style definitely make it in. Yeah, I, I love what you just said there that it's it, it about um, kind of recreating the the memory of, or the feeling of being in a place. Yes, that's, and now that you say that, that is exactly how your work feels to me as well. Like I'm in this, I'm in this kind of hazy memory of a, of a place that I may have been. Um, I don't know, uh, it almost reminds me of some of what I read and I'm not even sure if this is true. Um, in Renaissance paintings, um, the kind of invented backgrounds to some of the the portraiture, uh, it's just kind of hills and trees and they're mm -hmm. the hazy uh, Trisco kind of, of fading into the background. Well, there's there's an ele element of that kind of, um, it, it's just kind of a, a dream of, of a place. Yeah, there's this work. interesting thing that happens that I don't really like have, there's probably a word for this, I don't know. Uh, it's this experience that like it keeps happening and i've had this since i was since like for as long as i can remember where i'll be in a place in a specific place and i'll acknowledge that i am in this space in this point in time in this part of the world but there's almost this like sense of a like a deja vu or some sort of a like two almost two images being superimposed on one another so suddenly this place takes on characteristics of a completely different place in the world from a different time that i've visited or you know spent time in and it's this really strange kind of momentary experience that is really difficult to even describe like i don't know if i need this makes it's like sense there's gotta I'm be like a hallucinating word in another language right yeah <laughs> i don't know like there isn't one in russian that i know <laughs> i'm like trying to think but um that is something that i kind of um try to bring in the, into this work, which is not necessarily something a viewer would pick up on because it is such a personal kind of fleeting momentary kind of experience, but um, it does kind of merge two different places or two different memories or um, two different sensations into one sort of um, kind of layered complex image. And I think um, going back to that on a lot of these works kind of, it, it, it does feel like it's, a specific place but it's not but it has this other layer to it that is of a completely different specific place so it's sort of a a, a layer like a stack of different memories of specific feelings of being in specific places does that make sense yeah yeah and that's interesting that you say like how uh you're not sure if the viewers are relating to that because I, I would love to hear from each of you now about like how do you feel your your viewers or your collectors or the people who come to your shows their their personal identities 
inform their relationships with your work um, and how how they they who they feel as a person might impact the way they're per perceiving or responding to your art. So, uh, Gail, tell me tell me a little bit about your experience with um, uh, either collectors or people you've talked to uh, in relationship to your work. Uh, well, that's, I'm not sure about this question. Um, <laughs> I, I never think about the viewer when I'm making work. So, um, and I'm just thrilled if anybody, you know, responds to the work. Um, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't really know. It was, it was interesting for the show at Oceanside. Um, I got a, a lot of response from children because it was a whole wall of things that they could really relate to. Most of the time when children go to museums, they just walk through and, you know, they're forced to go. But because I had insects and, you know, narwhal and all kinds of different things, um, I think they were, they gave the best response. And uh, I, I thought that was really wonderful. It's something I had never really experienced before because I hadn't, you know, people who buy my work are not children. So um, I thought that was a great, uh, thing that happened for that showing so I was really glad that I did that piece for that exhibit yeah yeah that one I remember it very clearly uh that was um a, an important part of some of our programming that we were doing with children at that time and yeah, yeah there is something magical about having all of those particular forms together on a wall and actually when we were looking at the the picture uh that was in the slideshow earlier I noticed that there's so many different kinds of, of sea creatures there. Are they very all very specific sea creatures? Are they I mean, um, not like, oh, this is Ned, but like this is a specific. Um, well, the starfish, I mean, yeah. they're all based on real starfish. I mean, okay. they're, I mean, I make them up, but I mean, I did study so that, you know, anatomically they're sort of the way they should be. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, you know, I used artistic license. And then in the, the piece at the airport, there are also sea urchins. Mm, yeah, they were um, like purple and blue. Purple and red, green. Yeah. Um, and so they had spikes on them, but because it was the airport, I, I wasn't allowed to have the spikes where people could touch them. So I had to kind of adjust that. So I, instead of uh, on the higher ones that were higher up, they had actually, you know, uh, metal spines all over them. But on the lower ones, I, I actually used uh, dots in, in place of this, uh, you know, to decorate them to kind of indicate that they had these things. Um, so, yeah, it was so that they are, I mean, I try to be, so, you know, th there are um, sea anemones and sea cucumbers in the airport piece. So, of course, you know, I made the bodies out of wood and the tops out of ceramics. So, they're not realistic. None of them are really, you know, it's not photorealism, but um, it gives you the sense of what it is. Um, right, yeah. And well, you know, no, the kids, I thought it was great that the kids, uh, because I happened to be there one day when the kids were in front of it looking at the piece and I, I had no idea. And, and when I heard them talking, it was, it was so interesting because you just never get that opportunity to hear people talking about your work and especially you know, grade school kids. So I thought that was really, you know, and then when I went up and I said, well, you know, I'm the artist and if you have any questions and they, I don't know if they'd ever met an artist. So they were like thrilled, you know, and it was very sweet. And I, I, I think it was a great program that you did. And uh, oh, well, thank you. I, I will not take any uh, credit for that. I didn't believe that was our education director at the time. But it was a great. But it was an excellent program. Great thing yes. to the museum. I thought it was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, Jennifer, tell us, tell me about, um, have you ever had that opportunity like Gail's had that, to, to be in, in a place and overhear people talking about your work and they don't know you're the artist? Yes, um, I think I think it kind of unless you're wearing like a name badge or people already know you a little bit, they you know it's hard to to tell. Maybe mm -hmm. um, I've kind of had similar experiences where children are looking at my work, and it's very funny because because children are used to seeing like our photographs on our phone, and they think that they're real, and so kids will be staring at them like <laughs> kind of horrified or really really 
you know, scrutinizing them, trying to figure out like how, why is that child twisted up in that vine? And, um, and even my own children, they're, they're very young. So they think that those photographs happened, you know, they're like, remember when I was hanging up on that clothesline, you know, and oh, that is um, fascinating. they see the photograph or, you know, it's in our, it could be of a couple in our house and they, they just assume that those things really happened. And it's kind of That's an interesting <laughs> way to look, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I don't make art for the viewer either. Um, like I say, I, I create it from a place of, you know, my own um, experience. And when I, when I say my own experience, it's something that I know that is poignant and universal to some extent. Like I've made work about our relationship with death and, and how we, um, and how that kind of makes us human, how that's a gift that makes us realize we have a ticking clock. Um, and so when I made this work, I wasn't just making it for mothers. I was making it for um, people that have mothers, you know, and we can all kind of um, relate to the idea of, of what your own mother must have gone through or, um, you know, how beautiful it is that we can be connected to somebody. And um, also when I was making this work, you know, seeing children grow up, and seeing them change so rapidly, it only made me realize that I was changing just as rapidly within, you know, the opposite direction. And it really kind of grounded me in my sense of time um, and also made me think more about belonging to ancestors and, um, and kind of how, um, you know, being a mother is kind of like having a religion. Uh, traditionally, we thought of our children as a way to live on our legacies and um, we mold our lives to fit them. And we even keep relics of children. We keep their hair and their teeth. And um, the whole idea is very strange. And, um, and so I say, ultimately, the work is also about life and death. Yes, I can. I, yeah. It I can definitely see that uh, any work about children and uh, it, it really brings to the forefront aging and that um, they're here so that we can move on and that they can eventually have the children of their own. Yeah, it is really fascinating uh, that visceral connection you end up having with um, your baby that like, well, I, I have never ever had a relationship like that in my life. This is something entirely new. Um, uh, but then I, that's funny that you, you also bring up life and death because I'm admiring the, the barrows over Yevgenia's shoulder. And um, I, I'm not sure about this, but are barrows always burial mounds, um, pre prehistoric burial mounds are the ones that you do, uh, you illustrate, are they meant to uh, present uh, kind of a death? Uh, oh yeah. they Sort of. I mean, they um, they have a couple of different functions. They are mostly burial mounds or burial um, sort of structures, but sometimes they are strictly ritual structures. And there's you know debate about which ones are which or how many. You know, there's it's archaeology. There's a lot of speculation and 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 study in that area. But um, What's really interesting about them is, I mean, I've always, or I have been drawn to them for, for a long time because they, um, so the work that's, that's behind me on this side, um, mm -hmm. which was in one of the slides earlier, um, that's a specific, um, specific place. And that's actually probably one of the few works I've done recently that is about a specific place. Um, I was, uh, um, I did an artist residency in Ireland earlier this year, just right before everything kind of shut down. And um, part of the reason I uh, was really interested in working in that part of the world is there are, I mean, it's um, just littered with um, these really incredible prehistoric sites that are fascinating to no end for me. And um, we did this really brief road trip right before I started the residency and stopped at this um, little burial mound that I found on a map somewhere. I mean, there, there are so many all over the country that they're not, you know, they're not mapped. They're not really indicated in any way. You're just driving down the road and here is a castle. And on the other side is a prehistoric burial spot. And that's, you know, part of the landscape. And, um, 
we stopped at this specific one because it was really small and um, really kind of had the sense of being a really intimate space because a lot of them are, you know, much larger um, in size. And this was a really kind of a fascinating little um, structure or earth or structure. Um, it sort of had this, um, it's basically like a, a, like a ring and another ring around it. So it's called a ring barrow and um, it has a little divot in the middle. So it almost um, has this, like it presents kind of like a ripple, like a ripple in water. So, but it is, you know, hard ground that has been in that same shape for, you know, thousands of years. Um, and it was really interesting to kind of look at it as this sort of moving kind of breathing structure potentially and kind of explore that um, idea of it expanding and contracting and, and, and kind of moving. Um, so I did the series that um, sort of zoomed in on, on that ring structure and kind of liquefied it into a pool and then, you know, you zoom back out and it's, it's a, it's that ring structure again. But what's really interesting about um, these burial mounds and, and specifically like um, passage tombs, which are um, like a mound with a, a single entrance um, on one side, they, they are burial sites, but they also present kind of as pregnancies. I mean, it's, it's a mound on earth with a body in it, you know, so um, I was doing some research on, um, you know, the history of those structures compared to standing stones and, you know, why they, why both exist. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of theories about that, but um, there is a um, place in Brittany in, in, in France where about in 43 or 400, 4,300 years ago, um, they mostly were doing burial, um, structures with standing stones. So it was just a, a vertical stone that marked a grave. And it was sort of this, um, I mean, a, a symbol of sort of this male dominated society that was like, I mean, a, what is more <laughs> male dominated society than a standing stone. Um, and at some point, a lot of them fell over from earth tremors. And this idea of this thing that you have been, you know, um, of worshiping is actually fragile and is you know can be toppled sort of switched the way that they um the people were starting to build burial grounds and um they switched into these uh, to making um mounds and passage tombs that sort of have this like womb shape and they're you know again they're sort of these like pregnant um structures on earth so it was sort of this um the idea of unbirthing or returning back to the earth as you die and you you know you go back into the womb so it's it's just a really fascinating way of looking at um these structures and again it relates to the body and in, in a very like obvious way and so um there's just a lot of different different ways to kind of look at these structures and interpret them and you know i think it's one of the most fascinating things we can study. It really is. It is so fascinating, and I, uh, it's so true what you say that it's like, it's a not, it's a nothing when you're over there for just. There's no maps that lead to these places. Sure, you can look it up. Like, oh, is that a burial mound? Oh, let me Google that. Oh, yeah, it probably is. They're just everywhere. They're just, just so present, and is I think it's so fascinating that there's thousands and thousands of years of history of death and sorry sorry that sounds extremely dark but just being surrounded by that concept um on a daily basis uh when you're over there is something fascinating and i can see how that's so inspiring for for your work um and especially relating the body the human body to the the earth um and, and Gail, also, uh, you do human bodies in your work as well. Um, I know it's a lot of insects and a lot of um, sea creatures, but you have some work that is actually the human form made out of, or, or in the brick pattern, and then the, we saw the legs that made out of wood. And 
and are you what are you exploring there when you use the body is that is that based on a particular body or is it just um study well, you know when form? i think when i first started doing the brick pieces the first some of the first pieces i did were torsos and brick mm -hmm. and um and then like a leg and a, you know like a torso from the neck to the knees and then different ones um but i think what i was interested in was the fact that the body is this soft you know flesh and then doing and then brick the hard i i've always worked in contrast and and so that really interested me that you could have this kind of soft beautiful figure but it was made out of brick so um i did do a series of that and i i did a heart you know and then the ear mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and it, it was the contrast that really interested me in those what, what year was that year uh, i know we have that uh, in our files was that, you know, I don't, even, I don't. I don't even know. What day is, what is it? Time? What year is it right 13 now? Thirteen, oh, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> right. I, I can't remember. Right, <laughs> right. But to me, those those pieces also they feel like relics. They feel like statues, um, and uh, honoring a, maybe an ideal form, like the perfect ear, the perfect leg, the leg from the earth. Uh, in a way, so I feel well, like you know, the the ones that are like the wood with the ceramic foot, or you mm -hmm. know, there's a whole series of those, and hands that had wooden arms. Um, I was really thinking about the connection we have with nature that we don't have with nature, but I mean, that we should have with nature. So I was, you know, trying to make a point about everything is connected. So where the hand, where so parts of the figure were clay, and then parts were wood that I, you know, got gathered. And that's really what I was thinking about, trying to make people aware of that connection that everything's alive. Everything is alive, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you bring the bricks to life by creating right. living creatures out of them. All right, we're, we're, we're getting close. So I just have a couple of more questions. Um, just on on the subject of um, you know what what is now what is uh, time now um, it, the COVID nineteen isolation how has that affected your your work your practice um, your daily life I, I, Gail since we we were just with you tell us tell us how that's um, how you're working now well I have to say I'm very fortunate I feel like um, it hasn't affect affected me as badly as it has probably 95% of the people. Um, I'm used to being at home and in my studio and being alone. So I don't have a problem with that. Um, I can't travel and I have a son and grandchildren and mm -hmm. I find that incredibly, you know, depressing that I can't, you know, and they live in the East Coast. So that makes mm -hmm. it even harder. Um, but as far as my daily life, um, I've always, you know, I, it's nothing stopping me from working. And uh, uh, I think, and I have a, you know, a, a home and I have a lovely garden. So I'm not trapped in an apartment with where I have friends who are trapped in apartments. So I think I'm very fortunate. So, um, I, you know, I can continue to make work and that's so, good to hear. It is, it is good. <laughs> yeah. Jennifer, having two kids at home, um, that has got to be challenging. <laughs> I imagine at least the older one used to potentially go away for uh, part of the day, but he must still be with you now. Well, they're not in school yet. So my, my oldest is just turned five, but um, it's hard not being around other children. Yeah. So I think that's the hardest part. When we see kids out, we have to like run away instead of saying hi and that must be really difficult when you're when you're growing and um, you know in the beginning I think that's your your most important people are your friends you know mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder what that what that's doing to to their development and I tell him you're, that he's very lucky that he's young because he probably won't remember this time <laughs> you know, the rest of it will be his first memories <laughs> all right, right. <laughs> I hope you can avoid all that and. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm, we're lucky too. We have a little bit of space. We're out in the suburbs of San Marcos. And so I'm very thankful that we can at least go for walks in our neighborhood and, and you know, have distance from people. And um, we just kind of, our new normal is like we go hiking where there's lots of space. And that's 
that's what we do, you know, that we did that before, but it's, it's kind of harder to find space now. Um, but I think artistically, um, I like working alone and I've always made everything by myself. And so it's kind of been um, a rewarding time in a way to be able to concentrate only on making work and not so much with the marketing side of it. Um, and we're also um, in the process of moving to Switzerland. So we're gonna be leaving in three weeks. So oh my gosh, after. I'm so That's glad amazing. we caught you before you <laughs> left. So, wow, wow, what an incredible move. Yeah, so we're, we're excited about that. And you know, it's a little stressful getting there, but. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine, but that's gonna be, I'm sure that's gonna have an impact on your work and be find so many inspirations out mm -hmm. there that are gonna be really new for you. Or I don't know, I, uh, have you been to Switzerland? No. No, oh wow, <laughs> first time in three weeks? Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's gonna be so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. yeah, again, yeah. How has the uh, how has our um, strange times affected your yeah. your practice? <laughs> oh, I wish I was moving to Switzerland. <laughs> right. um, you know, it's been it's been a mixed bag. I um, so we got back. My husband went with me to Ireland when we were when I was in residence there, and um, we got back two days before everything shut down. So it was just very like shell shock of a moment um and i i teach um this past semester i was at a couple of different um institutions and so it was both were obviously switching online and that was a, a major transition that obviously nobody was prepared for and so my studio practice basically was put on hold for mm -hmm. a couple months until the semester wrapped up which was really um, difficult, especially coming off of a residency with all of this material that I wanted to work with and all these ideas that were just sort of percolating and sitting there waiting for attention and um, and trying not to lose that momentum, which was extremely difficult. But um, school's out, so you know that part is at least for for a brief moment right now is is on hold. So I'm back in the studio and I'm also really lucky to have a studio space outside of my home that is that feels safe to be in even though I share with another person it's large enough to have distance and it's been kind of a blessing having the space to just get out of the house and you know we are in a one bedroom apartment so it's a very you know oh gosh, definitely yeah. a very kind of constrained um, space but um, I've been back in the studio and working you know every day for the past you know couple months and um, realizing the impending doom of the fall semester so I need to start you know switching gears again but um, it has provided this really nice um, really focused time that's not interrupted by social commitments or anything that would otherwise be you know at all times kind of barking in the bag um, so there has definitely been a lot of really like valuable quiet studio time that I, I don't know that I would have gotten otherwise with everything I love else. That. So. I love that everyone has a positive experience or at least a positive take on what can be a challenging experience and so that's maybe that's why I'm drawn to you three your work because like I also like to look at these things very positively and find um you know what what good has come out of it despite you know what lots of other not so good things have come out of it but hey let's focus on on the really good stuff so okay so on our way out our last question is going to be gail tell me where uh, what's next for you what are you working on now or wh where can we see your work next if you have any engagements i know a lot has been canceled um for upcoming things um so if you're just working on new projects uh, tell us about it um yes um so i finished during COVID, I did the city, pro um, the, right, the last the city slide project. that was the city. Um, and now I'm doing, actually, I'm doing a lot of um, plates. Um, I don't throw plates, but they're slab plates. And um, so that's what I've been working on right now. Um, I don't, um, I think I'm in a show at Southwest that opened and closed in March. Like I think one day it opened, the oh, next day no. it closed. But I'm supposed to still be open 
through September. But um, I'm not sure. You know, every all the shows are on hold. It's hard to tell what's happening. But um, I don't really know what's next in my sculpture. And I'll just go in and putter around. And I guess I'll figure it out. You'll so. figure it out. We'll find out along with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jennifer, you, what's next for you is a giant uh, intercontinental move. Um, but uh, what what do you see? How do you see your your opportunities changing, or where your um, where your work is going to go next? Um, well, I've always been inspired by my environment, and I use organic materials that are local, and they make their way into my work. Um, and you know, even in the mother series, that some of the materials that that bind us together are the materials that are in my backyard. And so um, I'm really looking forward to having like a whole new <laughs> array of specimens to work with. And um, I've never really been drawn to the San Diego landscape. And so I've kind of struggled with that for a long time. And I'm very happy to, to get back to um, like more, more waters and more lush green plant life. And that's what I'm drawn to. And that's what I'm drawn to also when I make my work. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to see where my ongoing series, mother series will go and how it will be influenced by my new surroundings. Um, and I hope to, to make a work about the transition as well. Yeah, that'll be really fascinating to see. Well, I'll certainly be keeping an eye on your work on social media because um, I'd love to see how that develops. Um, Yevgenia, what's up next for you at the, the um, kind of looming semester, fall semester, I suppose? <laughs> Do you have that, any shows yeah. or any, uh, any new opportunities coming up? Um, everything's been on hold <laughs> or has been put on hold, so it, I really don't know. I, I mean, there are, I'm doing some projects um, just sort of self-directed things and collaboration, like long distance collaborations with artists, which have been really fun. Um, as far as exhibitions, I don't know. I, I came across a, a journal entry from, um, I think New Year's Eve from last year. I'm like, yeah, 2020 is gonna be so great. <laughs> and I'm gonna have like, I planned on, you know, somehow having this many exhibitions and a couple of solo shows in there and it's, obviously not happening but um I don't know who knows you know it's it's a really like it's difficult to plan for anything obviously so um kind of just hunkering down and making work and prepping for the new semester and keeping my eyes open and ears open for opportunities so Definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that some really interesting creative opportunities come out of this, that like once things start opening up, museums and uh, galleries are going to start really looking at like, oh, okay, well now things have changed. So let's do something different. Let's, um, let's reach out. Let's start featuring more uh, of what has happened recently. So there's a lot of things that can inspire work right now. So um, I'm also going to be keeping an eye on both you and Gail uh, on uh, social media or your websites because uh, really I just love seeing how how your work is progressing, Gail. As I said, I really love that city series. It's it's a really Beautiful. fascinating melding of hard and soft um, and uh, very abstracted forms. Um, and uh, yeah, Kenya, yeah, one day I will make it to your studio also, and I will uh, look at that giant artwork. Come on over. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wear I'll masks. Mask. We'll yeah. Be, yeah, we'll be good. We'll have your masks. Well, thank you so much, all three of you. It's really been a pleasure to talk to you three and to learn about your work. Um, you guys are so valuable being part of our community and uh, Oh, i so lucky to have been able to work with you. Uh, and hopefully we have opportunities again in the future. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you so much, all. everyone. Have a great day. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Here. Bye.